lights on. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing, testing. If anyone hears me okay, give me a thumbs up. Thumbs up, let's just the lights. Get them out of my face. Testing, testing. Testing, one, two, three. Good. Good to go, Art. Let's see how we're doing. We'll just do some, do some checks. All right. Looking good. Okay. All right. Welcome everybody to the stream. It is July thirty first, two thousand. 19 and this is going to be class four in our protection training series that we've been doing uh, for anyone that is new to the stream um, give you a quick quick overview over here um, if you're new to the stream, you should be able to get started. The best place for anyone who's brand new to this particular website, even if you're watching the stream, it's always good to watch the current stream, but to learn things in the best order, it is always best to start with the foundation style dog training course right over here, 4.0. And you can just click right there and then it just goes right down in order. This will give you a great base for training, um, training any dog really. Um, and then what we're working on here today is we're chipping away at our personal protection training course 4.0. And you can, our first class was here and then we're going down to our fourth class. There's bite building in play over here. So a lot of the notes and videos that I will use in today's stream, you will be able to find over here in bite building and, and play. Um, anyone who has any questions in particular for me, please put them in the chat that says protection, protection questions right there for me and you can make these bigger or smaller if you're on a um you know if you're on a on a desktop you could drag these pack howls where you could talk to each other really i sometimes whoops see what's going on over in here but this way it's easier for me to see the direct questions if you put them over there if you do happen to be in the live live classroom room itself which is where you can always see what's going on live over here because i do have the pack howl embedded right below there pack howl is right over here um it won't show up in the bark just protection questions are here and of course you can pm anyone who's online so if you, you just want to have a private conversation with someone who happens to be logged in this is the place the place to to do it and if anyone has questions for sure just you know just put it over put it over there some of the current members um nowhere nowhere to go um now the the site itself and the dog training itself this is foundation style dog training so it's 
you know, it's based off of foundations, um, priorities, right? So when we start training, we want to understand the dog's behavior itself, right? So that is the ethology. What is the natural behavior of the canine? And we work our way up and we learn the basics in the foundation course and the basics of training. But this is considered advanced, right? So anything else right up to the basics of training, which is in the foundation training, any little add-on course is technically considered advanced. So we take everything that we learn down here and it makes it easy to learn a few advanced skills and plug it in and it makes everything so much so much easier for us um, so I'm gonna go to my notes and we'll get started right so um, up to this point in the training um, what we have covered what you should know right is we should understand what the difference is between a personal protection dog, a sport dog, a police dog, and and the guard dog, right? And we will be getting, you know, we will be covering basically all of these through the through the course. Um, you should understand, or if you don't, you could find these in the previous streams. You should understand the basic drives of the dog because we are now going to use these terms, build it upon in each additional class that we that we do. And we should also understand the, the physiology of the bite, the different types of bite. That was last stream. Now that we know that, it gives us the ability to talk about some basic bite building through play that we can do with, um, that we can do with any dog. We could do with a puppy. We can do with an adult dog. And you can do it with a dog that you actually have no desire to do any sort of protection training with. Because most dogs do enjoy playing, right? Really, all dogs enjoy playing to a certain to a certain degree. You're gonna get your extremes that don't really want to do have, you know play much. But these things actually are useful for all types of training, especially this. So this type of um, play and doing bite building through play i do it with with all dogs i do it with with darcy who's gonna be running around over here right it's a great way just to get the energy out of out of any dog um so i'm going to going to get into it all right um so oh that's gonna be too noisy darcy um <laughs> all right um so there's so what I'm going to show you to do what I'm, you know, what I'm going to do is like when I was doing it in kennel training program, all dogs, all dogs, regardless if they were doing protection training, I pretty much did this with them because I scheduled it as a way to burn them out and to, um, is to burn them out and get out their energy and do something that was sort of natural for them. And all puppies I would do this with. So what will happen, <laughs> yeah, Darcy, Darcy is a constant source of entertainment. Um, um, and um, so, but, but then if you're, if you're a professional trainer and you have a dog that you're training with and you're teaching them to play in this way, and if they then want to move on and do more formal protection training, you have actually this whole time been priming them anyway. And if no one wants to do protection training, it doesn't matter because you really are just playing with the dog in the same way that they play with each other. Remember that um, with dogs, play is practice hunting, it's practice fighting, it's practice doing all these sort of things. And it's the same sort of stuff you see you see them doing in, in the puppy class, really. Um, so you're not... You're not teaching the dog to be mean. You're not like, you're not really doing, you know, doing much that's going to harm, that's going to harm the dog at all. I'm going to show you a quick clip of, um, of a couple of dogs. These were a couple of Dutch Shepherds that I had a couple of years ago um, that I used to bring to my class. They're really fun. And then eventually I found, you know, I found good homes for both of them. Uh, all these videos I have, these are just videos that are just from my library anyway. 
and I'll leave them there because you could watch them in full. Um, but first, I just want to give you an idea of like two dogs playing with the same tug, the same exact tug that I probably have here up on my shelf um, with each other and showing that they are playing, that even during play, they are, they are going to be doing some... Um, so they're even during play they're going to be doing a lot of the same techniques that we are going to join in and play with them all right darcy can you be any louder can you be any louder i'm just gonna close i'm gonna i'm gonna lock her out for a little bit hold on one second i'll let her come back in oh boy this is too loud. <laughs> I'll let her back in. I'll let her back in. I got softer, softer toy for her, right? Um, so let me switch over here, all right? Yeah, so if you watch here, I mean, this is just two Dutch Shepherds. Technically, I guess you could call one a Malinois. These are just Dutch crosses, like working lines. So it depends what color they come out, right? Um, and when I wanted to burn them out, these were two sisters. I would just kind of throw them a tug and let them burn themselves out. And I mean, I'm kind of joining in over here with them and playing with them. But uh, let me see, when they're by themselves, they're mostly by themselves here playing. Um, even during play, they practice a lot of the same things that we were talking about last week, right? Um, which is they will rebite to get a better grip. They'll, they'll, they'll shake the toy. They'll pull backwards on it. And this is just totally play, right? It's completely different from being any type of real aggression. They have the rope over there. That's why I stepped in to get them back, to get them back onto the, the, the tug, right? So I got them back on the tug and they're going to shake and they're going to do pull downs and they're going to do all these different things. And I give it back to them. So I used to do this with them. I used to just sort of, I used to supervise them so they wouldn't chew the thing up. And they would literally, like, I don't know, this video is like 16 minutes long. And the whole time they're basically tugging with each other. I used to let them burn each other out when I didn't have the time to really, the time to really work with them. You know, and these two, these two girls were good with each other. They would never would get into a fight. They would never scrap over it. You know, they were just a good match for each other. They were really good together, these two. But... Um, you know, here, what you see is, is, is rebites, firm grips, all these things that we're going to talk about. All right. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples in some of these other videos. So what I'm going to do, let me go over here and let me get my tug. I got a tug on the shelf over here. All right. <laughs> now... There is so much that you can teach a dog through, through tug work. And it is so much use to any dog, to any dog. Like when I'd work with dogs in a shelter, I always done this. When I did it in kennel, when I was doing uh, in kennel dogs, um, what is their age in that video? Oh yeah, they're, they were young. And, and that video, well under a year. Um, off the top of my head, I probably, probably at the beginning of the video, I say their ages, because that's when I was looking for homes for those two. I loved those two. I love all my dogs, let's say. They're, for video, oh, they were six months old. They were six months old. So they just finished, uh, they just finished teething. 
over there. That's I was able to get a lot of the a lot of the tug work in, in with them. Um, um, but the tug work now this is going into even in kennel training programs. You know, going back to even our foundation training and our, you know, in our in our first course. When I would do an in kennel training program, what always worked well for me is not only was I scheduling, of course, you know, the potty breaks outside and the training itself, I put into the schedule play as well. I put into the schedule play. I put into the schedule when they were going to get something to chew on. I tried to mimic um, a routine that someone could generally follow at home and it worked really well and of course it also kept the dogs happier and more balanced when they were when they were staying with me you know and less um less anxiety stuff like that so i would use this even in the in kennel programs when i would do consultations with people and they have either a puppy or even an adult dog if they have if they're having some sort of issue which potentially is related to the dog not really having an outlet or not getting enough exercise or stuff like that, which often they do. Same thing, I try to schedule, I tell them to schedule and play with the dog. So I'm not necessarily teaching them how to do like bite building and all the intricacies of how to actually use the tug. I would just tell them basics, right? Like keep the thing moving away from the dog, make sure they're using their muscles to pull. Because what's good about the tug compared to, you know, the advantage to playing tug is um, um, compared to say like ball, right? Fetch or something. Like if it's a rainy day or someone doesn't want to go outside, usually someone could find a place inside of their home where they can at least still play tug with their dog and burn the dog out. The other thing is, even though um, the ball, when you throw it, is more like cardiovascular for the dog, some of the dogs could kind of run back all day, you know, and they may get temporarily winded, especially if it's hot out or something, but it's, it's not necessarily working like um, strength. It's not working um, muscles. They're not really pulling. They're not, they're not really doing anything strenuous on their muscles. So often I can get, I can burn a dog out more with like 10 minutes of tug than I could do with 10 minutes of throwing the ball. You know, they'll tend to calm down for a longer amount of time. Granted, if, you know, you have, you're physically strong enough to play with the dog that you have, right? If someone has like a 120 pound dog and they're 90 pounds, it could be, it could be difficult. Now, there are a few different things that you want to work with the tug. I'll explain it right here while I'm holding it. But then we just watch it inside of the videos so you can see. And then we're going to use these. We're going to use these techniques actually in training the personal protection dog. Now, remember, through play, you can encourage you can encourage things that you want the dog to follow through with lessons that they learn that they follow through with for, off of the tug actually onto the person also in play in most cases before you make it before you make it real so this you know can eventually basically be the arm right what they're doing on this they can do on an arm or they can do on a leg or whatever and through repetition it actually builds their confidence they learn things um, they learn things that make them that'll make them win all right um, and if you use a cell phone okay um, now if, um, now when I, when you play with the dog, what you want to do is the goal for the dog, of course, is they want to win. Now think of playing with a dog, like playing and even the game of tug, like tic-tac-toe. All right. If we want to maintain leadership with the dog, um, while we play these games, um, ideally what you want to do is you want to start the game and end the game. But during the game, you want you and the dog, you both want to sort of win and lose. Now, when so if I was just doing a pet dog, I take this out, right? This isn't going to be laying on the floor. They'd probably eventually chew the whole thing up anyway if it was laying on the floor. I never leave this thing on the floor, all right? This 
A single tug like this will last me years and years and years and years if I don't let a dog shred it up. So generally what I do with the normal pet dog, right, is I take something like this, I play with the dog, I keep it pulling away from them, you know, I pull it away, let them burn themselves out. And I like using, I always tie a leash on a tug because what I can do is every once in a while, I basically let them take it and it slides out of my hand and I'm holding on the other end and they get this feeling like they won, right? And they shake it around and they may prance. I'm even like be at the end of this leash and walk around with them a little bit. And so they get a little win. They just won a game of tic-tac-toe, right? Then what I do is I reel it back in and then we play another game of tic-tac-toe. And the good thing about the leash is, you know, some dogs are going to keep bringing it back to you because they enjoy it, right? They enjoy the contest. Other dogs may, like, take off with it, right? Now you're chasing, chasing them all over the place. And they're always going to win that particular game. So then you're able to bring it in. And, you know, you bring it in and you, and you, and you fight with them. And then they do something that you want. And that shows them that they won. And you give it and you give it back to them, all right? Um, so that's the way that the concept of the general game. Now, if I'm also working with a pet dog, and we can do this with protection training dogs too, even young ones, is every once in a while, and this goes back to pre-MAC principle, right, which we talked about in our foundation stream, I teach the dogs really early the concept of releasing through pre-MAC principle, which means when I'm playing tug with them, Every once in a while, I will just hold the thing completely still and make it not fun for the dog, all right? Completely still. I'm not going to be putting back pressure. I'm not going to be doing anything when they shake it. I'm not going to be giving them any sort of feedback at all. And then the only thing I do is just calmly give them a word, whatever word you use, which, you, which will mean release. I use the word out, and I just calmly say out out and most puppies even if they don't know the word they get sort of bored and then they let it go and then as soon as they let it go i move the thing quick and i let them play again and we restart the fight again all right and then i let them win i let them lose and that's sort of the routine of how it goes but i do not do a lot of outs i probably with most like um with most puppies and dogs like i may do like one out randomly on a variable schedule for maybe at least you know maybe every like four wins on average that they get or maybe even more because i do not want the dog to think that they're going to have to give up this fight and if you it's just like playing with a kid right if you play tic-tac-toe with a kid and you're beating their butt at it and they can't never win they're going to get discouraged so the idea here is to make it as fun as possible for the dog while teaching them things all right so you want to teach them as much as possible how are you guys doing here in pack how someone's having a problem with the uh uh dave seems like he's having a problem with uh with the audio i mean it might be the browser it might be the browser all right um okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you different things that we want to encourage during play which you can do it with any dog. You could practice this with your Cocker Spaniel at home. It doesn't really matter, and it'll be good practice for you to prime a protection dog. So remember, the big difference really between like a Cocker Spaniel or a Labrador and say like a Dutch Shepherd is, you know, some of these breeds that don't, that, and I'm not saying actually for sure, I've actually met you will meet Labradors and Golden Retrievers that will bite people, that will protect, without a doubt. Um, but the biggest difference between dogs that don't necessarily mature into the form of doing serious protection is that, is their ability and their genetics as far as how much they, go, they are going to mature in, into a more adult-like state that's more similar to like their wild cousins right um the more um uh ne ne neotenized i guess would be the term that they remain um the less likely they're going to mature into that into that particular form which is also why technically like um, a lot of neutered dogs and stuff like that also don't 
don't always necessarily are not known to do as well as dogs that are left intact and that mature that are able to mature um, for a longer period of time if you have a if you have a working dog but you can practice this with any dog that has a strong enough play drive which is just about just about every dog all right um, so I'm going to go over a few things now there's priorities in things that you will be trying to encourage in the dog all right so the very first thing and you will see I'll show you in a video um, the very first thing that you're looking to encourage with the dog mostly not as important with the average pet dog right but a dog that you want to potentially do protection work is to teach them to get them in the habit of actually striking or not to be scared of striking. So let me explain, right? Someone has a personal protection dog or a police dog or a sport dog. This is true for any of them. You want them when it is time to bite, when they're supposed to bite, is to, to go in quick and hard and basically punch into the person on that initial hit as hard as possible. You do not want them to hesitate. So what happens is when we do, when we're playing tug with them, what we do not want to do, this is actually more important, what you do not want to do as compared to what you do want to do. What you do not want to do is when you're playing with them, you don't ever want to do this, right? When you're playing with them. So you don't want to get this tug, we want to play and shove it in their face or go like this into their face. There's going to be exceptions, which I'm going to explain, but you do not want to do this when you're playing because what happens, it gets the dog used to doing this and backing up for it. They get the tug and it's in front of them and they're going to back up because they think they're, it's going to like run right into them. All right. Um, and this is going to happen too when you go further into the training and you're doing bite suits or you're doing sleeves or whatever. There's a term called jammed. You don't ever want to jam a dog where a dog thinks that they're going to come in some, into something hard, but the thing is going to come into them and hit them hard, um, especially when we get away from the toy and it's actually something heavy like a person and the whole dog can end up getting injured. Their neck could get injured. They could hurt themselves and that will slow a dog down. So when you're playing with the dog, the first thing you have to keep in mind is do not jam the dog ever. So that could be simply when you're playing with the dog, when they're doing the initial bite, that you do not, I mean, you could tease the dog up a bit, but when it's time when the dog is coming for it, you should always have the tug moving backwards, all right, as they're biting for it. If I'm teasing a dog with it, when I'm in front of them, as they're striking, I always, to some degree, have this thing going backwards. I want the dog to think when it bites, it always has to reach, it always has to reach. And this gets them in the habit of striking, just like a snake. And it makes it more likely when something is standing still that their initial strike, they're gonna get more of their mouth on it, all right? So, and there's different ways to do it. The important thing is you just know the concept, all right? So you can play with the dogs. Remember, sometimes I'll show you clips where you're just playing with the dog by it. it's you and the dog. Other times you're working with a client and they have a dog on a leash, right? So if the dog is, station, is on a leash and they can't go any further, you could simply, as you bring this by the dog, usually you're going like um, perpendicular to the dog, right? The dog is facing this way. If I'm the dog, you're gonna tease them and come to the side like this you're going to pass by this way so the dog has to reach for it i often you will see in videos you know i do i like to kind of spin it and sort of like toss it out like this right so if, the, if i had dogs lined up against this wall over here i'm going to spin it tease them up and move it in front of them this way so they're all striking out this way for it alternatively if you have lots of energy, 
which I don't, I got lazier as I got older, you could take this and you could run around, you know, and run sideways in front of the dog. And, you know, and as the dogs are snapping for it, you're just pulling it back, pulling it back. And then that's okay, especially if the dog is restrained. It is totally fine to let them miss on purpose a few times to get them more excited, right? To get them more excited when you're, when you're, when you're doing it. But it's, you're generally going lateral in front of the dog, and um, and then eventually when I'm going like this, I'll bring it close enough where the dogs can actually reach it. And that's where they get the initial bite. So that is priority one, is you use a technique where the dog is going to strike. And I say if I bring, I could bring Darcy back in here and play with her, even if she's loose and I'm playing and then she releases it, Every time she goes in to bite it again, I'm going to, to a degree, just kind of absorb it and move it backwards a little bit during the play. So that's the first thing in your mind. If someone does not know how to make the dog strike and, and they're jamming the dog, you want to focus on that. And that's the first thing that I teach an agitator. If I have someone who is apprenticing with me, that's the first thing I drill into them. I'm saying when they're doing a drill, it's like, don't jam the dog, don't jam the dog, don't jam the dog. That's number one. Now, the next thing you focus on after that, before anything else, the thing of second importance is just teaching the firm grip, all right? Is teaching the firm grip. So what that means, and you'll see in all the videos, is once that dog bites and they strike, no matter what, even if they just get it with the front of their mouth, immediately, you're gonna put, you're gonna move this thing away from the dog with just enough pressure where if they start chewing on that thing or even if they try to get a rebite or do something, they're gonna lose it, all right? I'm not gonna go loose. I am not, once they bite, I'm not gonna move into them during the play. The pressure is gonna be off. So if I'm by myself playing with the dog, I may do just enough pressure to almost even get their front feet off of the floor, or they feel like their, you know, their front feet are just coming off of the floor. Um, in some of my videos, you may see me kind of showing off at certain dogs and sort of like getting them off of the ground. That is not necessary and is not always a good idea. You know, I would do that. Maybe it's not necessary at all. Maybe to show off a dog, and especially if the dog, I will never do that unless a dog has its full mouth or at least its canines and a tug like this are, you know, I got the second half of the mouth in there. Because what you have to watch out for, and this is a big mistake of um, amateur um, agitators, is they will take a dog, even on a tug, that only has um, a few teeth on this or a corner of a mouth, and they'll try pulling the dog up or pulling the thing back really hard. It's a big pet peeve of mine because what happens is when you use a lot of force and all of that force is just on a few teeth, you're more likely to break a tooth and you don't wanna do that. So you have to be careful. You're doing gradual pressure, but you do. If they bite, you gotta judge. Even with the front of the mouth on that strike, I'm putting pressure. But you not enough to break any teeth, but enough if they decide to regrip too early or get chewy, the thing is going away. And as soon as they let go of it, I'm gonna do keep away, um, keep away, tease them with it, and it's gonna be moving backwards until they get it again. And then I do pressure, right? If I cannot get the dog to just hold firmly, Firmly, I'm not going to encourage anything further than that. Now, this is the good thing is this is true across all, um, no matter which, no matter what you're doing, if you're doing a sport dog, police dog, or personal protection dog, straight across the board, that is a priority of you. And there are so many tricks. Like I say, I'm giving you some basics so you understand why we do it, right? Now, um, like one reason why this is one give you an example of one reason why why we why we want to do it. If the dog doesn't have a good grip, even on a send, if the, even if they have a good strike but not a good grip, if they run and they jump and an agitator goes to catch 
And the dog's own momentum as the agitator goes to swing around, if the dog doesn't have a good grip, that dog is not going to even be able to hold its own body weight and go flying off of the agitator. Um, so, so you need to have that good grip. And I've seen tricks. I've seen one sport trainer take like wet leather straps and play tug with the dog because it was harder for the dog to hold on. Um, and you see a lot of stuff with dogs on bungees and things like this against the wall. There are so many different tricks, but what you want to understand is why. And then it gives you versatility and it gives you the ability to look to see what other people are doing and be like, oh, that's a good idea. I can do that. All right. I've always kept things basic. I like keeping things as basic as possible to accomplish what I need. And I've been able to accomplish almost everything I ever wanted with any kind of protection dog, any type of police dog. We're just using a regular tug, right? A regular tug and know what I'm trying to encourage, all right? But that grip is priority number two, all right? Now, pri if the dog will strike on the tug and the dog will grip, next is you want to encourage the dog to rebite. You do not, even if you see a dog shaking, or doing a pull down or all these other things, I am not gonna give a dog a win unless I get the rebite first. So to go backwards a little bit, I should have said this, you can win, I told you about playing with any puppy that they get a win, meaning if I'm working on even the strike with the dog, um, I may play with a dog and they just give me a good strike and even put their mouth on this thing, depending on the confidence level of the dog, I may immediately release this tug and go to the end of it and let them shake it around or prance or feel like they won just for putting their mouth on the thing and making the attempt and striking, all right? You gotta know your dog and the level they are, and that would be considered the win. But then after that, if the dog gets a good strike, and the dog, and I put a little bit of pressure on the dog, right? I put a little bit of pressure on the dog, and the dog actually holds on to it, gives me a good grip for a second or two seconds, I may then let the dog win, all right? And then if the dog is still holding on to it, I may reel the dog back in, put a little bit more pressure, three seconds, maybe and try to lift the dog up a little bit, and then let the dog win, all right? So every time they do what you want, the more repetitions that you can let them win, the better. That's why I love the rope. You're able to get so many more chances to teach the dog what wins without completely giving it to them. Like you'll see, some people at like sport clubs and stuff, the agitator goes around, does something to the dog, just gives the dog the sleeve, all right? And then they go off and they, they work another dog or another dog or they or they do something with the tug, the dog gets the tug and they just give the tug to the dog. I've always preferred to get lots of repetitions in, bringing the dog in, letting them win, bringing the dog in, letting them win. You could just work so much quicker and teach a dog quicker if you use a rope because once you give it to them, in their mind they won and you loosen it up and they shake it around, but you just don't let them chew it up on the ground. You just reel it back in and you and you start and you start all over again all right um now the rebite the rebite is very important for lots of reasons right we want to encourage the dog that if it happens to bite it with the front half of their mouth or just you know anything in the you know in the front from just the canines and and forward we want to encourage them to bite in deeper the first chance they get for two main reasons off the top of my head. One, it's safer for the dog's teeth, right? They have more surface area. It's just going to be safer for them. Um, number two is they're, they're more likely to actually bite the person, right? If someone is wearing clothes, thick jackets, stuff like that, sometimes if they just have the cloth, you want to encourage the dog to go in so they're actually reaching the person. Those are two main reasons for real protection training. And of course, police dogs, sport work, yeah, it's for points. They'll actually, if someone, pretty much any sport that someone is doing, the dog, if the dog doesn't get 
their full mouth in there, they're going to have points off. Um, we're not going to get a good score. Uh, Mitch says, can you describe strategically getting the tug back after a win? Oh, okay. Um, good question. All right. Um, so there's two types of wit. I mean, after a win, there's, oh, so there's different things. Like, usually I do the most work by really never, I let the dog usually hold on to it, especially if I'm not working on the strike, because the strike, they pick up on it pretty quickly. So when I'm playing, normally once I play is, um, especially if I'm just by myself with the dog, I don't have an agitator, generally, um, I keep bringing the dog back and forth, back and forth, and they never really um, lose hold of the tug. Although, you can get slick. Now, there's a way, of course, you can basically tell them to let it go. Um, but also what I do, if I want to like work on that strike more, the initial strike, is sometimes when I give them the win and they get it, I completely let my end go limp. And they go to the floor after they shake it around, they do a little prance. They eventually, most dogs will eventually go to the floor and then let it go to put themselves in a position to basically start chewing it up. And as soon as they let go, I got my little zip over here and I just, boop, I just zip it right back to me. All right. And then, and then I start swinging it around and I tease them again, you know. So I just wait for it to go on the floor and then they tease it. Now, there's other alternatives. I'm jumping a little bit ahead. If you want to work with a transfer, train the dog to transfer, I'll have two tugs. I'll have two just like this. And then we're on when they're basically on the ground with the other one, I take the other one and I playfully smack them with it on the side. So suddenly that one that they're not chewing, um, that they're chewing becomes not very fun, all right? And then they you get their attention with the one you smack them with, or you can even just smack the other one on the ground and it gets their attention and you go back and forth and that. In play, I try not to do too much like, it's very easy to kind of like get the tugs back and forth and stay in control without even doing any formal commands. And generally when the dog is tired out, it's pretty easy to do like that final out and then like I give him like a treat or something. You know, I, I give him, I tell him out, I have some treats, I give him a treat, throw, or maybe throw a treat on the floor and I put the tug back. That's generally what I do in early training. Of course, this is, once you do some more training and you have the dog in like phase three training, you can very easily just use the obedience then, you're playing tug and then you hold it still, tell the dog to go to a place. And then you can even release them from the place and re, this is so good to do during a training session, especially a dog that has a good foundation of, of obedience inside of it. Um, let's see. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so it's so, so so yeah, so it's very easy to get it back, you know, back and forth. And so you can watch. I have some video. I mean, um, I have um some videos of me playing with dogs, and will give you some i give you some ideas. I would love, even without even going further, um. I would use these all the time and I would go in shelters and I would get like these pit bulls that were just like cooked up in their kennel and had nothing to pull on or anything. And they come out of the kennel and they want to bite leashes and hang on to it. The greatest thing that I would do with them is I would take two tugs like this. I would like, um, like sling them over me. I'd put them in my back pockets. I would always take two. Because you never, when you have two, you never have to get confrontational with the dog. I'd bring it like an old training room or wherever, and I would play tug with them. And a lot of it is about as long as you keep, they're very good. Remember, dogs play with each other. As long as you're not like yelling at them when you're doing it and you're saying, good boy, and you're having like fun, they will have fun with it. And then I basically go back and forth and switch in. So I always just have the one that's more fun. And if you have like some shelter dog, I say you want to get some energy out of some like four-year-old pit bull that's been cooked up in the shelter for two years and you don't know much about them or anything like that, you can tire them out like this. And, um, and then even the last time that they get a hold of one, even if they're not let go of it right away, you just 
take the dog. I would actually do it. There's a, I would actually hold the dog on a leash while I play tug for extra safety. There's a way you could totally, if you're good with the leash ninja, it's totally possible. I would have the leash. I would play tug. I'd be in tug with one hand. I'd always have the other leash. So I had control over the dog if I didn't really trust the dog yet. Um, and then the last time I would give the tug to the dog, I would just release the tug and the rope and I would just prance the dog around or let it walk and let it be proud until it dropped it or bring it to its water because it was usually hot. And then when it drops, I'll just walk away. And I would never even need to be confrontational with the dog, although I still stayed in control of the game, therefore providing for the dog and, and giving the dog leadership. I know I'm going a little off track here, but remember this completely relates to aggression rehabilitation. Some of my most aggressive dogs that I've had that have wanted to basically kill me when I got the dog is one of the best ways I got them to trust me and know that I am not, that they don't have to worry about me or the little things like putting down a bowl of food. And while I have the dog on a leash, just letting the dog eat while I have it on the leash and me just ignoring the dog. And if for some reason the dog, if the dog came for me, I have the leash. I could just like leash ninja, just keep the dog um, away from me, walk the dog and just, but that rarely even rarely even happens at all, all right? But the leash was just for safety. If you're good with the leash, you can keep any, most dogs off of you unless it's a gigantic dog that is taller than you and everything else. And if that's the case, you gotta be careful. You know, it's better with, with two people involved, double handling, um, wear more protective equipment, um, stuff like stuff like that. But then the other thing is, if I would get a dog and I would play with the dog and I'm playing, and you'd watch the dog's body language. If I would see the dog's hackles rise when I'm playing and they feel like this is confrontational or I'm a threat, I would, same thing, I would play with the dog. I would, I'd play with the dog. I would talk to the dog nice while I'm doing it. I let the dog win. I would get goofy. I get out the other one. I let the dog prance around with it. Just letting the dog play you being fun and remember when you're doing aggressive dog like that that's the good thing about the leash when you're even when you're playing tug you don't have to come all the way up in the dog's face and be holding it like this all right you can have the dog way out here and play with the dog where the dog actually feels less intimidated or less confrontational you can release that thing all the way at the end and you're still interacting with the dog in a form of play even at first, you will see the dog in play drive slash defense, right? You'll see their hackles up. But I would use that to read the dog's trust in me. And as their hackles start to smooth out, you let them prance around with it. You wait for them to drop it. You bring them out of the room. You clean the stuff up. They never get to really keep it. They start relying on you to provide for them. And you see those hackles smooth out. You see them start to go more into just pure play over repetition, over repetition, over repetition. But good tug skills makes things so much easier. But you do, I'm sure I could find a video of you know doing tug with the dog on a leash you know holding the leash to it at the at the same time great ex great exercise for bonding with the dog for dominance aggression cases um for for you know for for everything where you need to provide for the dog but you need to show leadership without being confrontational with the dog excellent it's been like one of my greatest tools that I've ever had when I was doing um, aggression cases in, in kennel environment or working with shelter dogs, all right? But I went a little bit off track, but it's it's relevant, all right? This is, it's all the same, all right? The best, the in my opinion, you, the, the best aggression, you know, the best trainers that can handle aggre um, aggression cases are the, are, are the trainers that just, in divulge themselves in aggression in all different forms just understand it you know get on that bite suit get bitten by the dog feel you know feel what it feels like watch the dog's body language just watch it watch it do it be involved in it it's all the same thing all right it's all really the same thing all right now getting back to the rebite is um easy there's different ways you can do it 
when you're playing and you have pressure, you have pressure on the dog, there's different ways to do it. If I'm playing with the dog myself, all as I do to encourage the rebite, I always have pressure. This thing is always moving away from the dog in such a way that if they start getting chewy, they're gonna lose it. But then what I do is every once in a while, I will just, I will release the pressure on it, you know, um, so it's not being pulled backwards and give the dog, just give the dog a chance to be like, hey, I wanna get a better grip of this and see if they do this. And it could be anything from they're moving their mouth to a quarter inch forward or burying the thing in their molars, all right? It depends on a lot of things, the dog's genetics, the confidence level, stuff like that. But if they do that, that becomes a win for the dog, right? I will usually give it to the dog at that point. If a dog is really good at the rebite, I may not give them the win at that point. I may continue the game to try to either get more of a rebite or to the next counters that I want to encourage, all right? So you have to be thinking, what do I want in this training session? It's basically shaping, right? It's like, it's, it's basically shaping. You know, what do you want the dog to really do, all right? How deep do you, you got a little bit of a rebite. Next time, let's see if I can get a little bit further or a little bit further without without getting to the point where the dog gets discouraged or confused or isn't fun or isn't fun for the dog, all right? So one way is if you're playing with the dog yourself is you just release the back pressure and the dog gets a chance to rebite. If you're working with like kind of like a novice handler, I usually have the handler and we'll go into handling skills. That'll be a whole nother stream. But basically if they're just like a post or the dog is back tied against something and it is impossible for the dog to go forward, right? And I'm doing the old spin in front of them. Then they finally grab the thing. And they're usually only because they're stretching, stretching, stretching. I keep it just out of their reach. And then so they can usually just grab it. I go in and then I have to, you have to, because it's impossible. They can't come out any further. You have that back pressure. I will lean in, give them a chance to rebite, and then they get their win, all right? Or if they're more advanced, I won't give it to them right away. I'll put back the back pressure. And then at that point, I will look for, um, you know, I'll look for the next counter before they win. Now, if you have a more experienced handler that is holding the dog off a wall and on, on a leash, I actually prefer to communicate with the handler. And soon you start like communicating back and forth with that handler and, and you start to even know how to read each other and they know when to do what. Where if you have a handler who's on the leash, and I could probably find clips of that too, or you will just notice it if you watch like clips. Um, matter of fact, I know there's a very short snippet of, of, um, of, of Jerry, the trainer Jerry I work with on my like sale video. I'm playing tug with his dog and he lets the dog in for a rebite. You can also, if you're working with someone and they have the dog on a leash and they're actually doing the pressure backwards, you can give them a nod or you can talk to them and they'll, let, they'll actually let their dog come forward. And I prefer that better because the dog gets in the habit of taking their legs and driving into you. All right, driving into you to rebite instead of like you coming into the dog. But for the most part, it's going to accomplish the same thing is you want to get the rebite. So even this is the important part. If you're not getting that rebite and even if they're shaking, they're doing pull downs, they're doing these other counters, I am not going to give them a win until I see they rebite. The only exception is is if I'm trying, trying, trying for that rebite and I think the dog is starting to like lose focus or is gonna give up or is confused, then I will give it to them for the shake or something else or for a pull down um, before they lose their confidence or interest in, in the game. But you gotta make that judgment. It's okay to take the loss, like, all right, I didn't get it this time, I'm gonna try it, try it next time, all right? So I'm giving you a lot of information. There's so much with just a simple little exercise, right? Um, but this is what makes the great, this is what makes the, um, the, the, the great agitators that are gonna make the dog better. And I'm not even getting into the eye contact and the hitting and all that stuff, right? Um, so there's even more to it after this, right? Um, so after you encourage the rebite, the next thing then, now this depends, I consider these two equal, all right? 
Everything else is a priority. You have to get, you have to encourage a strike first. You, you, you need to encourage the, the firm grip. Then you need to encourage the rebite. Now, thrash versus pull down, I consider them equal. And this becomes, what are you trying to encourage? All right. Me, if I'm doing a personal protection dog, I consider these two moves both about equal. You know, um, I prefer the thrash where they, I think it's more painful. And if like a dog is protecting someone, I think it's a better, I think it's better. Although if I cannot encourage the thrash and the dog naturally just tends to pull down more, I'll go with that too. I will encourage that. All right. Now, um, police dog, if you're doing a police dog, me personally, I believe police dogs, it's not good for them to thrash. All right. It's going to make it harder for police officers to cuff the person. Yes, it's going to cause more pain. I think it is okay for them to thrash. Like if someone is fighting the dog and kicking the dog back or something, and they tend to go to that move more natural, fine. But I don't like to encourage lots of thrashing just because they're on the bite, right? I don't think it's for the reasons we discussed, it's not the best thing. Although a pull down is very useful to a police dog. I'll give you reasons why. Is one, once they bite and they get the full mouth, if they learn to anchor and pull down, if someone is still trying to run away, it's easier for them to kind of stop the person. You will also see lots of footage of dogs actually biting people and literally dragging them out of cars during vehicle extractions. The people are more likely to go in the direction of that dog it's just like a martial art, like with a pressure point. They do not want their flesh to rip. So they are going to go in the direction of the pulling. And um, so a lot of police, they do encourage this, especially if you have these more like high speed advanced police forces and they're practicing all kinds of tactics like extractions from cars and stuff like that. You will see that. I've seen um, police officers have like a long line on their police dog, send the dog in for an extraction with the dog on a harness and then help the dog if it's a heavy person by moving back, push, pulling the dog backwards too to help drag someone out to where that they, where they can see them, all right? So again, this is about understanding the different bites and how useful they each are to you. But the thing is, once you get into the rebite and you have the rebite, you can encourage either one. Generally, if I'm encouraging those, if the, have, if the dog is confident enough and I got the dog get to that point, that's where in, we're just talking about play at this point. All right. I may start in play just touching the dog petting the dog, giving them little playful smacks on them, stuff like that. This will often trigger a natural response to counter, all right, where they may shake the tug or they may pull down. Some are going to do it even if you don't touch them or you don't do. You do playful little like kicks on their side. Remember, this is practice fighting, all right? It's practice fighting. So you do these things with the dog and then you see they give a good shake I release the tug again, right? And good boy or good girl, right? This is a game. You bring it back in, you do the same thing. They give a shake, they give a pull down, whatever you're trying to encourage, you give it to them, all right? Um, and that's generally how it's going to work when you, play with the, when you play with the dog. So those are both equal and they come very natural to the dog. Some dogs more natural to others. And like I say, I tend to go with mother nature with the, with the dog. So if I'm working with a client dog or even with one of my own dogs, you'll typically know like some dogs like, oh, this dog is a thrasher. Some dogs, they bite and they love to, like, you know, some of like the, the pit bulls and stuff that I played around protection training with love to thrash. Um, and then you will get certain dogs, certain bloodlines that are thrashers. Other ones, you cannot get them to thrash at all. And um, 
are, are mostly just going to bite and they're just going to hold, especially um, um, catch dogs. Like if anyone, like some of the bulldogs, if they were really from strong like um, lines that were used for like catching boar and stuff like that, they'll bite and they tend to just bite and pull. They might rebite, rebite, but they'll pull down, pull down, pull down. You're not getting a lot of shakes from them. And that was because for their purpose, no one wanted that behavior. It was ripping off the ears of the boar that they were supposed to be holding on to, then the boar could get away, right? So, so you will see with breeds and even with certain lines, you're going to get more thrashing and holding. A lot of Rottweilers, in my opinion, are really good thrashers. No one was really encouraging them to be calm, you know, bites. Um, um, so you'll you'll see tendencies even in you know even in certain breeds. But certain breeds like German Shepherds, it seems to be with the lines. You know, some lines thrash, some bite deeper. So I generally go with Mother Nature. And I'm happy with it unless someone for some reason really, you know, needs one or the other, or if it's borderline, if the dogs could go either way. In my opinion, I always went with mother nature when it goes down to those two. Now, the next one is um, the transfer, which I usually don't kind of, I mean, I will mess with this right away with, with a puppy. And it's one of those things where you have to, in my opinion, you have to sort of make a decision about it. Um, um, you know, earlier the better with the dog because there's, you know, when it comes to the dog getting, suppose someone's doing like a sport dog, right? If anyone wants to do any type of sport with their dog, I do not recommend a transfer. Matter of fact, you probably, there might be some dog sports. I really don't follow the rules to all of them where maybe it'll be okay. Or you might just have to, um, but generally, a lot of the dog sports, they want to see when the dog bites that it's going to take stick hits and it's going to do stuff and it's just going to stay on the bite. For a dog that's definitely going to be used as a police dog, I would not encourage a transfer either. The same thing is what happens if someone is struggling and they're trying to cuff the person. You do not want the dog transferring and going from one spot to the other when there's potentially four officers sitting on top of the guy, the guy first. You know, generally these dogs are going to have backup. I would not encourage it. Um, and you will see certain lines of dogs if they're really, really hard. Some of these like really hard KMPV line Dutch Shepherds. Even if you want to teach a transfer for the dog, it's really, really hard because they naturally have been selectively bred, some of them. It's like the more you try to get their attention on something else and like hit them with something, they just keep biting whatever they have even harder, all right? But it does not mean, but I've done it. I've taken Dutch Shepherds and I messed with transfers and stuff like that. But certain dogs and certain lines of dogs, it is much easier to train them to do it. But I would say the average dog, it is easy to do it with. You know, the average dog, except for dogs really heavily selectively bred to take a beating and just not let go. But in those cases, the earlier you start, the better with it, all right? Now the transfer, it's you need, to, the way that I do it in play is easy. I just take two two of the same kind of toys. It could be this, it could be two rags, it could be anything, two rope toys, whatever you happen to even be playing with with that puppy. And you basically do everything that we are doing, but on the wins in particular, the best way to start it and makes it easier is when the dog is on the, is on the ground, just chewing it. I just take, I mean, if you wanna take it easy on the dog at first you could just like take it and like slap it on the floor or something and get their attention they'll let go and go to the other one but then what i'll start doing is i'll start like smacking them on the side i'm just like annoying like they're they're messing with it i'll smack 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 on the side and then they get kind of annoyed and they, ah, and they go to the other one and they start i start to play again and they start learning you teach them this concept oh i'm getting hit with something um i can go bite it and not only does it stop someone from annoying me, it gets fun again, all right? Then when the dog is good doing it on the ground, really easy. Once the dog is good over there, then I may do it 
when the dog just won and they're kind of prancing around with it, I'll start smacking them with the with the, to- the other toy and they let go and then they start biting it. And then more advanced play, and you'll know when it's time when they'll do it. You could be playing with the one tug and they can have it. You could play a tug, then you just pull out the other one and smack them with the other one. And they're gonna let, be like, oh, I know how this goes. I'm gonna let go of this one because you're not gonna do much with this other one once you start smacking them. They, they transfer to the other one. I'll show, show you a video. And then they start playing with that one, right? Um, and they, they start playing with that one. And that's kind of how you basically do, do, do the transfer, all right? So that covers all of them. I'll show you, I have more videos here than probably I even, um, than I even need, you know, than, than I need necessarily for this class that you can go through. But I'll show you some of the more, um, the ones that kind of show this in action a little bit. Let's see what we got here. Got a question. Darius is playing around with food and tug rewards here. Think I've been pushing out too much. It's a fake ferret cat toy that she loves. Let's see what we got over here. Let's see what you got, Daria. So that's perfect. Yeah, so that right there is, I mean, that's an example of kind of like what you're looking to do in your training sessions. Um, now, old school, right? Like people used to say, don't do any obedience with the dog until you've done all the bite work. That was the old way that they would like train police dogs and stuff like that, or even like sport dogs. They would, wouldn't do anything with these dogs until they got all the bite work done. Then they would do control. And it was because obedience was so damn rough, they would like destroy the dog's confidence before they did bite work. Now, if you know what you're doing and you actually train in a way where the dog trusts you and they understand it, you do a phase one, phase two, phase three style, you can do exactly what you see in that video with Daria, right? Is you can, you can just incorporate the tug into the control work right away. And it, what happens is this is why I say, if you have a good foundation, protection training is easy. You will see like you can incorporate, um, bite building in a training session and then you will see it will just as naturally flow into the next step of doing this in play on the man like on a bite suit or something and then for real and you you it's smooth it's easy it's actually easy all right if you have a foundation so that was beautiful that was a great example i love that um and so I'll show over here, let's see, I'll show, I mean, I got, let's see what I got over here. Um, that you can look at. We saw that. These are, you go watch, I mean, these were, these videos over here were when I was, um, 
looking for homes for its three juvenile dogs. That actually Gypsy is in here. She's in a lot of the Phase One videos with um, with Teresa, and she ended up going to one of my clients who had another dog, and he ended up doing Bike Club with her. But you can just see me doing general play with these dogs. Um, and there's three dogs over there that you'll see this style of play with that you can go and watch you know, after the stream is off. This one right here, I'll do this one. This is actually Orfeo. This is Orfeo as a puppy over here. And you could, I'll just, I'll show a little bit of clip. You'll see a little bit of this kind of in action. Um, let's watch what's going on here. There we got the old spin in front of them. And do the run, run, run around technique. So that was me working on the strike. I'm moving it away from them. Now, one thing to mention here is, well, I'll go into this on other streams. I am starting to with these young, and these they are all young here. They were technically, they weren't even six months old. They were kind of in the middle of teething, so I wasn't putting too much pressure on it. Me, as the agitator, you never do this with your own dog, all right? Um, you never do this with your own dog. I'm agitating for these dogs. I am slowly getting them used to the agitator being like a little more like becoming more of a combatant. So you see more yelling, stuff like that. It's still totally play to them, but... Um, I make I'm getting them used to a little bit more violence in the play from a very from a very early age with them So that's why you're gonna hear more yelling and stuff like that So also what I'm doing during this is I'm triggering them to counter, you know So I may smack them on the side. I may yell I may look at them and If they but that's gonna be for a different stream probably the next stream. All right um, yeah, Or fail baby or fail over here, this is our fail. His sister bit him on the side of the face. That's the patch there. Okay, there's a rebite. When you go back and watch these, you will notice what's going on, but you'll see some transfers here. You see, I'm pulling it back. He's doing more shakes. I'm not giving it to him right away because he's more advanced. I'm doing kicks. I'm making him take more of a beating before I give it to him. That's where the transfers have gotten to with that point. That he's at the point. A couple of these. He he was probably the more the most advanced right there. Yeah, these tugs I got from 4dogtrainers.com. You get them from a lot of places. Learberg, Bridgeport Equipment. You're going to smack, smack, give it to her. These dogs were all encouraged on transfers. Rebite. He's ready for it. Keep 
Okay, she lost her grip. I moved it away. Rebite, I gave it to her. So you see, I did not give it to her there when she shook because I wasn't satisfied by how deep she was biting. Once she gave me the rebite, then I gave it to her. So in your head, you always have to have this priority system going on. Don't reward them for one thing if they don't have the base thing um, at a satisfactory level. Now the important thing, see with Orfeo, I'm running into him to smack him, right? So I'm teaching him the basics of just like biting an arm that's coming in to hurt him with something. Now even that, like I say, I do not do that unless the dog is very good with their strikes. And if you notice, I'll back it up. As I swing down on him, as soon as he does strike for it, I actually start moving my arm backwards again to absorb the bite so he does not get injured. Watch, I'll go backwards a little bit. Let's see. So you said, I don't know if you noticed that. I come in and then I pull backwards as he goes to bite. You do not want to injure these dogs or do anything that makes them want to back up. There's a third dog off to the left of there, Vance. Notice when I came in, again, if you ever watch the replay, I come in, I pull back at the last moment so he doesn't get jammed. Watch here. I come in, I pull back. I'll say there was a shake. Oh, how my pop-ups? I should have disabled those. All right. You guys get the idea. All right, you guys get the idea. I'll show you. What else? There's a couple of other videos over here. This one's a quick one. Don't do this necessarily. This one was just shows you. This one's more of a temperament test. Where I was just showing, this was my dog Mouse. He was in the other stream. It was the one I gave it to the police officer. Um, he reacted to aggression, even as a puppy. You start yelling, throwing down chairs, anything. He would just react by barking and coming forward. So it was just kind of showing a test. But you will see that um, I'm not doing this with him. Me handling them. Someone else is handling them. And we're taking the little puppy. And he's just getting fired up with all the yelling and the whip cracking. But then I kind of like let him calm down. And basically the same sort of stuff we're doing here. But this isn't necessarily what I would call a good training session. I was just trying to demonstrate the dog's um, temperament, how it reacts towards a whip. Other dogs, like actually the, those group of puppies in this previous video when they were younger, I have videos of them around cracking whips and they just really didn't care at all. Um, some dogs don't care at all. Some dogs act more aggressive towards it. They all act a little bit differently. But I always love using my tug at rope.
I let them win. So it's just putting like pressure and doing things, but I let him win. And then I do one more where I'm cracking the whip while he's holding on to it. And he just gets mostly noisy. And I mostly just rewarded him for hanging on during all the cracking of the whip. And then I calmed him down to reward him for hanging in there. But I normally wouldn't do so. That normally wouldn't be a good training session. I say it was mostly just testing his temperament and see if he would hang in there. Um, now, last video, it's here. The quality of it sucks. But it would be interesting. That's that dog, Nico, that we showed in the other stream that we were doing the agitation. The, like, flanking and all that kind of stuff. We were showing the drive stuff. This is early when I got him, like, even before we did all that other stuff with him, where I was working on his bite so he would have techniques on the suit. And you, There is an old... Remember I showed you the video of him... Um, in the earlier streams where he bites me, bites Earl in the suit when I'm peeing in the woods and he does the transfer um, when he goes to hit him with the crowbar. This is a session with an older dog. It's the same concepts but slightly different. It's the biggest difference is I just don't have ropes on the tug because he would always kind of come back to me to play with me. But if, I won't play this all necessarily here, but you know, because it's 12 minutes. But it's just a training session, and I actually go into explaining some of this stuff towards the end. But the quality sucks. This was from my old website that got hacked. And, um, but it's, uh, if you watch it with, um, let me see. I might even be doing a transfer with them. I'm doing the same sort of stuff with them. Putting back pressure on them. And then I would sometimes reward him when he'd give me what I want. See, right there. So an alternative that I would do with this dog is you, I didn't, instead of releasing the rope, I would make my whole body sort of go, kind of go dead. And me going kind of dead and weak was like a little win. And then I would give it to him, it's like a big win. It's just a different way. You're you're giving the dog feedback. And even in like play, I was giving him little grunts. You know, he knows that it's play. Um, but I was just encouraging certain behaviors. And somewhere in here too, if you want to watch this, you'll see I'm hitting him with the tugs and everything like that too. Um, where is it? Maybe it's at the end over here. I mean, I'm just giving him love. He was a cool dog. I love Nico. Keto master. Here. Maybe not. Let's try here. Oh yeah, I have the other tug in my pocket. Let's see. Oh. 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 There we go. All right. So you get the idea. Any questions about tonight's stream? I mean, this sub, this we'll be talking about this more because there's much more to this, obvious, obviously. But this will give you kind of a start of understanding some of the basics of what we're encouraging even during play. But these techniques are, they're great for everything, not just protection dogs. You could just do this with any dog um, in play. It's just, we slowly, 
which we'll cover, I'll probably cover it in the next stream, you slowly can make it more aggressive. Um, but it gets trans, at that point, you're transferring it to someone that the dog does not have a bond with, you know, when you, when you get to that point, you don't do it with your own dog. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to confuse the dog at that point. Um, I know I have protection questions. Let's see what we got here. I think I even had one from last week that I forgot to, forgot to cover. Um... We got from Sharon. Let's see what we got. I've made a lot of mistakes with Shinobi, with tug work. I think I jammed him. <laughs> I jammed him. This was the most recent time I worked with him. We're trying to get him used to back pressure. Let's check it out. Yeah, like hit him like that. Yeah, like that. Like basically swing it into him like that, where he has to catch it. Oops. Also, the swing behind me, because I'm trying to go in like a circle. Good boy! Good boy! It's not helping. Good boy. 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 He's a thrasher. Oh, that's awesome. I thought that was great. Yeah, that was a good job. Do you have any ideal training frequency? Times a week, week or month for this type of tug work? Oh, more the better. Every single day. <laughs> Every single day. When I was... Um, when I was in my heyday and I had like Nate and Danny working for me full time and we were just doing like, we were doing bite work like every day with every single dog. Like two, if I was, um, if I had clients dogs in for like an in kennel and I'm doing like bite work, like those dogs are doing bite work like twice a day um, for, for sure. As much as that dog wants to play, you can, you can really do it. I mean, you got to feel the dog out. The average, like, working dog temperament, yeah, you can do two sessions a day with them, you know, but you feel them out. You know, you play, and ideally you stop if you really want them to, like, um, um, be crazy about it. You stop them before they completely had enough, you know, and then they want more and more and more and more and more. Um but the dogs love it, all right? And it's versa. As long as you understand the concepts of what you're trying to teach with the dog, um, there's, there's different ways. I'm showing you the way I do it, but I want to make sure you understand what we're trying to teach. Because when you, when you know the basics, you can look at what other trainers are doing and be like, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. You know? um, like one thing I'll tell you that I don't like that I never really liked is you will see some trainers to get the rebite. I've always put the back pressure and then let the dog on their own make the motion to rebite. I see a lot of trainers are in the habit of when the dog is biting, they go in and like shove the dog. Have you ever seen this? Shove the dog's head deeper into the bite themselves, like shove the dog's head in there. That's one technique I never liked that, um, I always thought it was dumb, basically, because one, it could trigger like an opposition reflex of the dog to actually pull away. Um, and two, the dog's not really doing it themselves. It's like you taking the dog's head and shaking the dog's head for them. I never saw the point to it. I've never had a problem with a dog that genetically had it into them to do the rebites of just doing the rebites them 
themselves. I never like that shoving the head into things. And you'll you'll see, you'll notice it. You're like, oh, that's what Mike was talking about. If you if you never saw it before, um, 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 let's see. Did I miss any other question? I think there was a question from that I missed. The art put in. So this was he put this in the other day, and I missed it. Art says, how many police departments and similar organizations use e-collar on their dogs and operational as opposed to training situations? I recall Ed Farley saying that when he was a canine cop in Wisconsin, his dog, his dog did wear an e-collar. But I didn't see an e-collar on any of the dogs in the stream videos, other videos I watched. If not, why not? Um, good question. Um, I think it's becoming more common. Traditionally, yeah, not a lot of police officers used it, mostly because to put it bluntly, most police officers are not that not that good of trainers. You know, they were handlers and they didn't necessarily had in recent times a lot of the trainers embedded in police or in these departments learned mostly like a Bill Keeler method, like an old school method with choke chains, this and that. And they just were not skilled in using the e-collar. So they were using it for like, you know, for like random things as just plain brute force. But they're not traditionally too many police officers that were using them that were really using them for like obedience and recalls and stuff like that. They just didn't know any better. Although for sure, it's definitely becoming more common with the police officers that are involved with, you know, in better training programs, you know, or have bigger programs and are more proactive about, you know, about doing the right thing. But yeah, a lot of police officers, you really don't see them on a lot of, on a lot of police dogs still. I would say for sure, most police dogs are not e-collar trained. Um, but it's because most of the, most of the trainers that are in, that they are using were officers that learned from another officer and they're mostly using like Bill Keeler, Bill Keeler method. Um, although it's changing, you know, you see with the internet and everything like, and there's much more like cross training with civilian trainers now and stuff like that. So, so you will, you will see it. All right. Um, okay. Well, I guess, you know, this one's gone. It's going on 90 minutes over here. So and this, I don't think I think we got all the questions. I'll hang out for a few more minutes too, unless there's anyone else wants to say, you know, say something. Um, but I'll close I'll close this one out for for tonight. And um, everyone, I thank everyone for coming. I thank everyone for the for the support. And I will see everyone next Wednesday. All right. Good night, everybody.